Okay, while my uh, colleagues are joining me, I'm Phil Odens from Black Duck Software. Um, I did not understand enough French to know if I was introduced, but I think, I think things are moving in that direction. That's great. Uh, Black Duck's a sponsor, happy to, very happy to be a sponsor of the event today, and uh, we uh, provide services and software that help companies manage and uh, govern their uh, developers, and encourage, by the way, uh, developers' use of open source. Um, we have involvement in the Geneva uh, and other communities, as well as our own Olo community, which you may know. I'd um, like to first thank uh, Gael Blundell for organizing this today. Uh, he, he pulled uh, this great panel together, and uh, in our first meeting, he ranked everyone by uh, their knowledge on the uh, subject matter that we're talking about today. And the first, the top six ranked went over there, and uh, he asked me then to, uh, to conduct the panel. Um, he also, uh, also asked me to do it. I think he thought it would be amusing to hear me pr pronounce everyone's names. Uh, but I'll try to do so. So uh, Ralph Miller uh, runs, uh, he's the director of uh, ecosystems for, for Eclipse. Um, he has a lot of experience in open source communities um, all across Europe. Prior to Eclipse, he worked at uh, Vector Informatic, he worked at IBM, uh, Object Technology, and also Siemens Nixdorf. Uh, Paul Abere, uh, he has 20 years of experience in developing software for satellites. Um, he's with uh, CNES now, the, the French Space Agency, has been there for about uh, almost a uh, little more than 10 years, since 2001, and he runs onboard, onboard software development there. Uh, Andreas Graf, um, also German, um, he's uh, uh, working on the Eclipse Automotive Industry Working Group. He's at a company called uh, uh, it Itmes, and uh, he's in charge of business development for automotive there, where he works with OEMs, uh, o uh, open source suppliers, tier ones, and, and the like. Uh, he was also at, uh, at BMW for a while. Uh, Bruno Grasset uh, from Vallejo. Uh, he's our, our guy who really understands infotainment. He's been in that business for a long time. He worked uh, at Peugeot before this, and uh, he's uh, running one of the expert groups at Geneva, so he'll be a great resource to talk about that community. Uh, Pierre Gaufillet, uh, he's a software engineering speci specialist. He works at Airbus, uh, and he's really into uh, open source and computer-aided systems engineering, and he's a, he's a big advocate of the open source strategy, and his goal is to, is to have all open source tools in the uh, Airbus uh, case system. And last, we've been talking a lot about software, we actually have a hardware guy in uh, Loic Urbane. He's headed engineering and research units for about 10 years. Um, he was involved in the development of Innovant's uh, aeronautic embedded systems, or test benches, robotic systems, uh, and he's led a lot of scientific and industrial programs uh, all around uh, open source, and right now his big thing is open source hardware communities. So we've been very careful to use the word systems here, not just, uh, not just software. So uh, thank you, uh, thank you guys for coming. Um, so I'll just I'll just say a few words, uh, and then I'll uh, I'll get off the stage, and uh, well, I'll stay on the stage, but I'll let these guys do most of the talking. I think that most of you are aware of the uh, the great importance of open source and open uh, development in general for innovation. And there's a great virtuous cycle where more innovation brings more open source, more open source brings more innovation. Uh, and uh, as you can see, uh, the number of open source projects out there has been growing exponentially, as one would expect with a virtuous, uh, virtuous cycle, to the point where, where today there are upwards of 700,000 projects going towards a million, tens of billions of lines of code, you know, a value of hundreds of millions of euros of, uh, of development time. Uh, and we're getting to an interesting point in the world of open source with the evolution of communities. Open source has always been about community, but there's some things going on that are sort of beyond communities, and we're using the word super community, to talk about uh, a trend we're seeing in many different uh, industries, in healthcare, aerospace, automotive, finance, uh, mobile, all these hot areas for, uh, for any technology, but particularly for open source. Even Marine, I'm actually speaking at a conference next week in Malta, uh, that's sort of Geneva for, um, for uh, ships. So it's, uh, it's all about these open platforms, these, these super communities, uh, developing in these vertical areas. Um, they're aligned around an industry platform, typically. 
They're usually self-organized with some players uh, from the industry um, uh, up and down the supply chain as well as sort of across competitors. And I think that's one of the most interesting things from my perspective about these super communities is uh, the the aspect of coopetition, if you have heard that term, cooperating as well as competing at the at the same time to achieve a common good. And typically, that common good is some baseline that is uh, not core to everybody's uh, business in terms of differentiating their businesses, but it's something that everybody needs, so a platform or tools or hardware. And that's really what we're going to be talking about today. And it raises some interesting questions. How do these communities form? How do they work? What makes them successful? What makes them uh, uh, sometimes fail? Um, and what are the benefits? How, how uh, you know, what is it that's so good that it brings competitors in the room all, all working together on a, on a common goal? So these guys are some of the world's experts on those questions and, um, and we'll be uh, addressing them now. So uh, first of all, I'd like to ask uh, some of these fellows, I think, I think most of you will talk to, to give us just maybe two minutes each on on the super community you are involved with, and in some cases it'll be more than one, um, and uh, just just tell us about it what, it, what it does a little bit, and we'll be getting into the workings after that. So first I'm gonna call on uh, Pierre and Paul to uh, talk about PolarSys. So a few words about uh, PolarSys. Um, it came from the idea that there was a need uh, in the uh, in the community of embedded systems to uh, create something around the engineering tools. Uh, tools are uh, completely at the center of the process. The process is complex to develop on board software as well uh, as the complete uh, the complete embedded systems. So the idea was definitely to find synergies between people working in the same area in space in uh, in aeronautic as well as automotive and many others. Uh, so first of all, the idea was definitely to cooperate on, on, on those tools and definitely open source was one of the, the solutions uh, and in particular in, in order to ensure uh, long-term support. So uh, open source was at the beginning of this and, uh, and now uh, there is this uh, creation of, of policies which is uh, definitely uh, making the community uh, cooperating in the long term. Uh, I guess that others will uh, explain a little bit more uh, about yeah. policies. Here. Just to give a, a compliment regarding the way it is seen at Airbus, we, are, we have some trouble with... Uh, with uh, the, uh, the current, in fact, uh, in the with the current business model used uh, for tools, for years we are specifying tools at Airbus, mainly because it is uh, absolutely required to get to the right level of safety when you develop, for example, avionics and so on. And the problem is that the life cycle of those uh, products that we are developing is absolutely not the same as the life cycle of, uh, of the tools. And going to open source was a mean for us to get some... Uh, uh, freedom degrees uh, in terms of, uh, of control on the, on the strategy uh, around those tools. Uh, but if you do so, you remove, I would say, the central point, the focal point that you have in the, with the, the proprietary approach, where the tool vendor uh, can uh, gather the needs and decide uh, of the strategy around the tool. And we needed to organize uh, in an explicit way, I would say, a community that would uh, be able to take in charge this kind of thing. That's how, in fact, uh, the idea of Polarsis uh, uh, have, have born. That's fantastic. You know, the, as I understand it, some of the planes we fly on today are 30 or 40 years old, and the tools need to, need to last that long to support them. And, and uh, these guys have convinced me that open source is the only way to do that. Uh, Bruno, maybe you could tell us about Geneva. I know that stands for Geneva IVI, and maybe you can take it from there. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's a word play uh, that, was, that was selected. So it is IVI for in, in vehicle infotainment. So what we want to do with Geneva is to uh, define and develop an open source software platform for this kind of um, ECUs. And um, it is... Um, today we have 
around 170 members in, the, in that community that are working together to, to define this open source dreamed platform. And uh, we, we definitely believe that we can leverage and, uh, the innovation that is linked to this uh, ECUs thanks to open source. And we can compete and ally all together and not uh, try to be against each other to define all the commodities that we need to define an IVI system. That's great. So it is made of uh, 10 OEMs all around the world. So some are Americans, some are European car makers, other are Asian. And we also have a lot of uh, tier ones and ISV or OSV and open source people that are helping us to, to define this, this great project. Right. Even Black Duck. Even Black Duck, yeah. <laughs> and and, and the, the supply chain starts back with the chip makers who are, uh, who are involved in the system as well. I think it's incredible. Um, that's not all that's going on in automotive, though. And, and uh, maybe, Andreas, I could ask you, as, uh, as the guy who's running the, the IWG at Eclipse for Automotive, what are some of the other things that are going on in that area? Um, in automotive, and I think uh, that applies to other embedded industries as well, the OEMs uh, are facing a situation where, for the development, they have a tool chain that consists of a set of tools that don't really work too, uh, too well uh, with each other. So um, they are constantly looking for a better integration and a better workflow in the tool chain. And uh, in the automotive industry, several companies, several OEMs independently came up uh, with the concept that uh, Eclipse would be the perfect platform. So Eclipse is to many of you will be known as a development IDE, but it's much more. It's actually a very flexible and powerful uh, tool and application platform, plus a large set of uh, open source software components that make it easy for you to create your own tools. So, and um, tooling actually is divided in two parts. One that actually adds value, where you bring in the tools for your innovation, and there's also stuff in there that uh, is just infrastructure, does the basic work. And uh, so several companies said, okay, now we are uh, using Eclipse. Uh, we are strongly focusing on Eclipse. Uh, Bosch is one, Continental AG is one, BMW. Uh, and they said, okay, let's to, uh, get together, just for example, like we do in Autosar, and work together on the non-competitive stuff um, so that we can share our experiences, reduce expenses, and uh, get a better tool set. In addition, all that has been said uh, about the uh, aer uh, aerospace industry, about long-term availability, obviously applies uh, to the automotive industry as well. And uh, ri right now we are dealing together uh, in, in the group with several problems, um, dealing with big models, so autos are automotive, Software systems are getting big. We need to handle big models. Uh, we have to define a common tool platform. And uh, for those of you who are into safety, you might have heard of uh, ISO 26262. And there's a big question mark in the industry. How do we deal with that when we use Eclipse or custom-made toolings? And that's one of the issues we are dealing uh, with as well. That's great. It, it, isn't it wonderful to see an industry that's been around for more than 100 years being on the cutting edge of, uh, of this kind of development? Um, I, I guess we, we ought to hear, for completeness, let's close off with uh, Ralph from Eclipse. I know I, there's a lot going on. Well, we're, 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 we're getting to Loic, but we're going to have you just jump in on uh, what are some other things going on at, at, a, at Eclipse outside of auto that, uh, that, that sort of sound like super communities, if you could just name a couple. Okay. So, I'm Ralf Müller from the Eclipse Foundation. Um, this is now the advertisement block. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, I want to point you to our conference in Germany, Ludwigsburg, the EclipseCon Europe, that is going to happen in two weeks from now. I hope you all come. Who has registered? Nobody? Okay, I have tickets for you guys. <laughs> Actually, you get a discount if you pay now. Uh, the, the second thing is, yeah, no, this was the advertisement block, that's okay. Um, other other activities there. We we do have uh, another working group that's called Machine to Machine. There you there's a, a, a couple of companies got together to 
organize themselves about components that you need for the future Internet of Things technologies. And uh, Benjamin, you have a talk tomorrow, I understand. Uh, on Benjamin will talk about how they are organizing this group uh, in Eclipse and what the benefits are. So join Benjamin's talk. Another theme that came up in the, in the prior uh, introductions already was all these organizations, they are now using open source for various reasons because they basically have to and there's no other options that they have. Now a problem with open source, it's, it's produced by many but not supported by many. So the long-term support issue came up a couple of times. So how can we guarantee that these things are actually made available for the long run and uh, supportable for the long run? So that's another working group that we do have at Eclipse and that is, uh, is prospering and very important. I think it's the first time that it's done by any <coughs> uh, uh, open source foundation in, uh, on that large scale. So we are again on cutting edge and uh, we will make a couple of mistakes, but Pierre, we will get it right, really. <laughs> well, that's great. Thank you. The, one, one more thing. Yeah. There's another group that we are just putting together, which we call the Science IWG. So when you look into science in general, uh, there's many, many components for, visual, for visualization, for uh, vectorization, for dealing with large data, to giving insight into large data. And we have found that in the science industry, may this be uh, chemistry, maybe this be physics, or you name it, you always find many, many people, many, many organizations who are using Eclipse and are building these types of components for themselves, for their products. So we are trying to harvest these types of things and bringing them under one hood where you basically will find for your per use these components in the future. Great. That was too long, eh? Yeah, it's okay. Plenty of time. Uh, so why don't, we, why don't we turn it over to Loic? You know, uh, all this software stuff is great, but of course none of it makes any difference at all unless you have hardware to run it on. And it, isn't it interesting to know that some of these open development techniques are happening in hardware as well? Yeah, thank you. I will present uh, the Babylon project, uh, which is a project, uh, um, its topic was to explore for the community how could we develop um, open source hardware components ready to be um, integrated uh, in embedded systems. Um, the second point uh, um, we had to explore was to study which kind of economic model uh, could we propose to uh, this community. This afternoon, I, uh, I'm pleased to, to present to you uh, for the first time uh, first result of uh, the economic approach uh, that we can propose for embedded system industry. Hmm. Okay. okay, great. Another advertisement, but, uh, but a good one. We should, uh, we should all sit in on that. Um, I, as, I, as I said in my introduction, one of the things that interests me most about these communities is seeing competitors work together. I actually run a, a group for the Linux Foundation called uh, SPDX, as long as we're doing advertisements. Uh, it's, a, it's an industry standards development group for, uh, for exchanging information about software package contents. And I work shoulder to shoulder with arch competitors. Uh, so I'd like to get some take from the panel and maybe uh, we can ask uh, Pierre and Bruno to, to both talk about it. Pierre, maybe you first. What is it, how is it that competitors benefit from working together? Well, this is, this is what you said earlier. We are working on, uh, on part, uh, on components that we are using in our developments, but most of the time it's embedded uh, either in depth in the products or it is tools so that it has no added value at the end for, for, the, for the, the product we are selling. So based on that, it's easy to, to cooperate with, uh, with other companies. And uh, to be honest, it, not, it is not the case right now, but we will be very pleased uh, to, uh, to have um, Boeing, for example, as, member, as a new member of Polarsys. It would be something very good for us. Do you, do you find yourself, like I do, taking off your Airbus hat and you know, <laughs> putting on your, your other hat when you're talking to competitors and you try to just put that out of your head? No, we have, we have common concerns. We have also some things that we cannot share, of course, but it is yeah. not the place to talk about that. And uh, um, considering only the common concerns, there are already a lot of things that we can do uh, to get, uh, to get more, more value of the work on each side, in fact, for yeah. each competitor. Yeah. So. Um, 
no real problem, I would say, on that topic. It's not. Yeah. A, it's it is just of a matter, I would say, for each company to select the topics that uh, that they want to uh, yeah. to bring into this uh, this open uh, this open end communities. Somehow, I mean, it seems like it's a little easier. Might be a little easier with tooling than we're talking than when we're talking about the actual product. So maybe you could hand it over to your neighbor there. And Bruno, how how do you feel about working with competitors? And and you've actually worked for different competitors, so yeah. maybe you have an even more interesting yeah. perspective. Yeah. I would say it's not a problem to work with competitors as long as we are not competitors anymore when we are in the alliance. Yeah. We, we share requirements at the OEM, OEM side and we um, make all these requirements be agreed by all the OEMs so that we can build the software components based on these requirements. And we, we all believe that we don't have any added value to define our specific Bluetooth stack to handle Android mobiles. And it's the same for any other OEM. We, we don't have to have a specific Bluetooth stack to handle, again, the same mobile phone and so on. So we, it's, it was really fast to just say, oh, we need to agree yeah. on how to integrate this. And for the end user, the, the person that is in the car driving or the passenger, he, he doesn't see any difference if we have this kind of stack or another one. But he, he can see the difference with the HMI. And that's where we are not in Genevieve. We are not in the HMI and the application part, but we are what's, below. What's HMI? Uh, the human to machine interface. Ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we, we, we don't stick with, with that. We only want to define a middleware that hides all this basic stuff of connecting devices or talking with the, the car network or all this stuff, or even handling the, the power management. The end user doesn't care. So we need to go all together to define the solutions that apply for all the members. And why not having open source for that? Yeah, it makes sense. So is it, re is it mostly about cost reduction and, and sharing costs across the community? Is that, is that the biggest benefit? Of course it is cost, but also it is the quality hmm. that comes with and the time to market, because uh, we are competing today with all the mobile phones and so on. Yeah, and yeah. We, was, when we start developing a car, it takes us three or four years to get it done. But for the mobile phone, if, if we start with some technologies at, at this time, four, hour, four years after, they are going to be completely obsolete. So yeah. we need to go really fast. And we need to be there to change everything in six months, like it is in the mobile phone industry. It's hard in the automotive <laughs> industry, but that's, that's our challenge. Oh, that's very so interesting. So it's also time to market that is, that is uh, in, yeah. in, in, in the scope. Oh, that's great. Ra Ralph, did you have a comment? Yeah. I, I think it's, it's not just about uh, saving time and saving money. I think sometimes it, it's, uh, the, the issue is even harder. What I experienced in the automotive industry, and uh, I was involved very early in Genevieve, for example, um, it, it is really changing the, the way the industry collaborates, and it's the way, changing the way how, which, what, what companies have what influence. For example, BMW had to make this choice, basically, to, to call its supply chain at bay. Otherwise, the supply chain would have dictated the architecture of the car for them, and BMW would have been just a... Uh, in German, we call it a, they, they push out the, the boxes, right? Yeah. So, so in order to, to gain air control again over, over their products, I think open source can become a strategy if you are too dependent from your suppliers or from an ecosystem or something. Oh, that's great. Sorry, I just wanted to add. No, that's good. I think it's great. Yeah, Paul. Yeah, if I may illustrate also on the space community. Maybe it's uh, an industry that is a little more old-fashioned than the automotive. I don't know exactly, but uh, I suspect. Um, maybe that the competition also is uh, less hard than the one that you have. Uh, as a consequence today, uh, it's clear that for the embedded system itself, uh, th there is a, a reluctance from industry to go to uh, this strong cooperation. So for tooling, as we already said, they are much more in favor and uh, there is no doubt they contributed to all those initiatives. They are in policies as well as all the, uh, the other things around this. Um, for, the, for the onboard product, um, 
as I said, what we have succeeded so far is in injecting open source that was coming from the outside. So this uh, was the good way and the right way to initiate the virtuous circle. Uh, the, the, the most famous example is the use of Airtems, which is the open source operating system that, that is now spread in, the, in our satellites. Uh, and, and this was the, the, the first way, I would say, to cooperate because then we, we have uh, succeeded in, in qualifying, for instance, I mean, make, make it qualified for Fly, uh, for our applications, and this was uh, a, a strong cooperation between actors, the space agencies, as well as the industry, in order to do this once, and not several times. And, uh, and this we are trying to continue, I would say, uh, in, the, in the long term with, uh, with, with other kind of building blocks for, uh, that, are, that are now ready for fly. And uh, I think this, was, this is probably the good way to proceed, because uh, as we all said uh, at the beginning, our industry was much more competing also on those layers of the, of the onboard system. Yeah. So it's quite a challenge to go also to that level where uh, you identify things and uh, that are standards and, uh, and basically on which they have interest to cooperate, so that to invest once rather than several times uh, in each, uh, for each of them. That makes sense. So, so Ralph, uh, Paul alluded to, to some of his experience in starting up one of these communities, and I, I know you're about as experienced as anyone in that. What's, what's been your experience in how to, how to start one up? Yeah, so going, yeah, really, we have, we have seen a couple of failed uh, approaches, and then it's clear. Some of them fail, some of them actually are successful. Um, what I've seen in automotive, what I've seen in Polaris, they, be, they became successful. And I, th I often think that in this space, just the pain was big enough for the companies so that they had to, had to go and had to do this. Otherwise, and again, it's not about savings, it's really doing your business. So they might have actually come to a point where they could not innovate anymore or could not support their fleets anymore. And they saw this risk and they had to manage the risk. So they came up with this strategy. Do you guys know Elinor Ostrom by any chance? Who knows Elinor Ostrom? Only Stefan? That's impossible. Well, she's, dead, so. she's dead, yeah, so sorry for that. <laughs> so Elinor actually received a Nobel Prize Award in economics, I think. I have it in front of me. And uh, she, she said, when, when she, she was basically coming up with design principle for what is called commons. So most open source projects uh, you can subsumize under the word commons where people uh, invest and also appropriate the investments later on on a, on a large scale. And she basically said, you, ne you need to have follow these eight design principles and then, then you will be successful. And that's really what we have seen in, in the past too. Most of the organizations that started off did violate one of these principles. For example, they did not clearly define what they want to do. So they didn't define their boundaries. Or they were not very... Uh, they had not, no rules of engagements, so they had, no, they had no monitoring of success, they had no monitoring on how these things got appropriated, or how, or how you could appropriate them, or how you could uh, actually invest into them. And sometimes, often, there was, as soon as a conflict comes up, the whole thing falls apart. So, what we have tried to do at the Eclipse Foundation with the concept of the industry working groups, Basically, we have learned without knowing of uh, Elinor at the time. We have studied and learned and worked with these communities that now became the super communities, and this was especially uh, the top case project at the time. Um, we have investigated, we have learned, we have tried to also change our Eclipse organization in a way that it actually follows these design principles and what we have learned from the early early adopters of this type of strategy. And uh, if you want to have the conversation about that, it's, it's not possible to do it in the last 13 <laughs> minutes, but I will be around and Pierre is around and uh, Andreas is around, so they all know how, what we talk about and what it takes. I strongly suggest to look up uh, Eleonore uh, in the Wikipedia, again, her name is, I spell it for you, Ostrom, O-S-T-R-O-M, Elinor Ostrom. Look it up and read a little about it. It's very, very uh, good reading. Yeah, that's great. 
And we do have 12 minutes and 49 seconds, so I think we're fine. Because <laughs> I just have really, really one more question, and I'd like to throw it out to the group, and, and uh, maybe we can start at this end, but everybody should just feel, to, feel free to contribute. And it's what all of you are involved in these communities, and, and you're here because those communities are successful. What does it take to make them effective and successful? And maybe maybe give us the top you know the top one thing you can think of, and then we'll, we'll delve down. <laughs> okay. So um, with the Eclipse automotive industry, I would say it was a long breath because we started in uh, I think it, it started late 2008, and then 2009 came the crisis, and nobody really had funding for, for nobody was allowed to travel to the to the Eclipse meetings. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, actually it, it started to really uh, blossom and go on in the last two years, uh, and yeah, and that's that's so you have to um, you have to have the goal, a common goal, and not lose it out of sight. And uh, obviously, um, the common goal is one one of the things because uh, we also needed some time uh, because the different companies had different focus on the issues. So uh, one company had in one year more budget for the uh, big model problem, while the other was working on the CDT development environment. And so the goals didn't really fit together, and uh, that really made it hard to do common planning. And uh, that, that is one of the, the things, is that you find a way to have a common budget uh, to actually finance uh, your activities. So a, a common goal and... and uh it's especially important at times of crisis, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good. Somebody else have a thought, Pierre? No. Well, uh, you're holding the mic, so you have to have <laughs> a thought. <laughs> I can be the second one, no problem. Uh, I would say that a little like you, that having a, a common, a common technical pr uh, problem is uh, is something uh, very important because you you need to gather all your your potential partners around something strong. And having something deployed that you need to maintain or to develop further uh, together, for example, is one strong in incentive, in fact. I would say also that a, a good communication and marketing activity is absolutely required. It's not, uh, it's not a secondary role. You cannot rely only on the technical side because you are a technical guy. You need to go, to go, uh, to go on, uh, on marketing. Uh, as a, as a guy who's made his career in marketing, it's heartwarming to hear that from a technical guy. Thank you. <laughs> Who else? We don't have to go in order. Maybe to say something that was not said. Um, I think that also success is uh, around the leader. Uh, I think there are some key actors, and maybe that uh, Pierre is too shy to say that Airbus was definitely a leader in this uh, polar seas and at the early beginning with top case and all that stuff. Uh, just to illustrate that, that there, should, there should be some, uh, someone leading the train somehow. Uh, and it's not, it's not only leading the train for their own interest, it's also to lead the community. And I think that in that sense, after having those leaders uh, working and injecting ideas and being confident, putting also some money, comes the time of uh, governance and rules in order that all the actors are properly represented and that they all have interest, all, their own interests are also uh, taken into account. So I think this is a, a good example to illustrate that you, you need a leader and then you need an organization that is in place uh, in order to uh, definitely and, and uh, honestly, I would say, share the objective of all the actors I think uh, this is one of the key that's right. success so, criteria. So, so not only do we need a common goal, but we have to balance individual goals, and that's very important. And market them. <laughs> yeah, so just to accentuate this a little, what was said before, sometimes I experienced the fact that companies or people from organizations showed up and said, we want to participate in this open source project, in this good thing. And then I asked him, so what does your management think? And yes, they said basically, oh, our management, they, they actually are forbidden to use open source. <laughs> um, so that's a bad situation to be in. If you really want to be successful, you have to take care in your organization before you actually start participating that this project or this uh, thing that you want to do, this uh, mutual undertaking is actually uh, 
presented and agreed upon by, by your internal organization, by your higher authorities in your organization. If you fail to do this, you will fail in the midterm because they will cut your funding. It is not important to them. Uh, you will not be able to participate and at the end of the thing you will not be successful with your task. So I'd rather, I, I strongly recommend that organizations that are coming together and do this rather start only if they agree inside their organizations that they should do this uh, before they prematurely jump into such an enterprise. Hmm. Log, you have some thoughts? Yeah. Um, I agree with everything that, that has been uh, uh, talked about or said um, on software activity. It's the same thing, the same problem in the hardware uh, domains. And uh, people here have to know that um, the open hardware uh, model um, can uh, offer to you a lot of uh, extra business opportunity. Don't to to, uh, to uh, go on just <laughs> go on on uh, hardware too. I guess it's really in I, sh I should have asked in hardware it's really the design we're talking about right that's so it it's sort of soft in that way is, is no that right? I, I'm uh, I'm talking about electronic parts or also mechanic parts or. Even um, uh, not always a program uh, PLD uh, or VHGL code or often a kernel software part, uh, the very lower part of uh, a system. I'm talking about all the subparts mm. that uh, constitutes uh, a system, an embedded system. And uh, ev um, everybody has to, to win in such community, in such open hardware uh, concept. Yeah. Let's see, Bruno, I think you've been quiet for a little while. Uh, I just wanted to, to, to add that we need contributors also. Okay. Yes, we need money, we need leaders, but we need people to work in, in the community. We, are, we don't expect people or companies just to be there to have their logo on the website. We want them to contribute. Mm. That's the key issue also for, for open source project. It's the same for for the, the, the communities. We want people to work in it, and that, that's it. Yeah, I think it's really important, and uh, I think uh, I, the project I alluded to that I've been involved in so far has operated essentially without a budget, a little subsidy from the Linux Foundation, but you know, I, I think Ralph's point really comes to mind. You need, you need the buy-in, and in a way, money is a test Right, it's it's a it's a test of the uh, level of interest of a company. You, you know, somebody's got to sign off on it. What it, and we didn't talk. We we practiced a little bit. We haven't talked about this question. But what's is there a way to think about what's sort of an appropriate level of investment for companies to be making? Do you do you scale it with the size of the company? How how do you do that? And how do you involve smaller companies in a in a project if they're if there's you know the big leader like Paul talked about. Maybe, maybe one word to that, and uh, you guys can add more to that. One, one of the things that seemed to uh, crystallize out is that in, in the, the super communities, we have many, many organizations that are, let's say, consumers that are not necessarily building something themselves in this open source project or in this open source uh, community, but they like to consume and they have ideas what they want. And then there might be others coming in uh, who, who can make a living out of basically building this in, as, as the, the consumers want. The interesting piece is that it's done in an open process. So there might be an open bidding process where companies can bid for a certain amount of work or for a certain project. So they, they basically appropriate value there. But also they, they create some, some goods which then rests in the commons. The, and, and the other guys actually do the explain what they want to do and, uh, and what they need in order to conduct their business. For example, they need long-term support or they need uh, tools for automotive or they need X, Y, and Z, which they don't have the resources or even the knowledge to build, but they know what they want. So it's really like a, a little bazaar where people get together and negotiate in a very open way and in hopefully a very well-conducted way on what, what happens in there. 
So we see that some of them will invest resources and capture some money, some payment, and the others are actually investing ideas and thoughts and needs. They are willing to pay for it because they need the results. Mm. And what they get is they don't, they all only pay once for that. That was a remark that uh, you made before. And they get really what they want. They don't get some uh, product that they don't have any influence on or little influence. I, I actually like this idea of smaller companies having an opportunity to get involved. And I was thinking back to some of the early keynotes today where a lot of the focus of this conference is in starting up, starting up smaller companies and, and making sure that it's a nurturing environment. Uh, anybody else have thoughts on how smaller companies can, can and do contribute to these communities? Paul? Maybe just an example. I think this illustrates uh, perfectly uh, the, the debate. Uh, we, we have uh, invested today in a time and space partitioning solution for space. And it's not dedicated for space, but by the way, I mean, we, so we, we found those people in, 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 in Spain, and uh, the product uh, is called Xtratom, and it's open source. And I'm 100% sure, I mean, at least I, at what I was the one deciding for this uh, solution that will be spread in the coming years uh, on board satellites. And this is clear that we wouldn't have invested in this solution if it was not open source. And today we are working with a small spin-off that is uh, offering services and uh, improving the product so that to make it fly. That's great. Locke, you had a thought? When you say to make it fly, you really mean that. <laughs> to really make it fly. <laughs> Yeah, the problem is not of, uh, about the size of uh, a company or of uh, an organization. It's, um, uh, you have to uh, know exactly what will be your role in the community. Mm. So uh, if you know what you can share, what not to be uh, shared, because of your own strategy, business strategy, it's not a problem because you can uh, bring uh, something to the community uh, and so that's no problem. Right. Well, our time's coming to a close, and there have been so many good ideas, I'm not sure how well I can sum it up. But it sounds like for the, these communities, uh, many of them are very effective. Some fail. None of the ones we've talked about today, they're on great track. Needs a common goal, needs to uh, a leader uh, and recognition of, of everyone's goals, needs some marketing as well as a, a technical side of things, uh, needs some money, but there's room for smaller players and, uh, and bigger players. Uh, and these principles apply, you know, across the world of software, but systems as well and into hardware. So I think it's, it's a very exciting area for me personally. I'm watching it closely. Uh, maybe we can come back next year and report on uh, progress of these, these communities and probably some new ones that will be uh, popping up over the next 12 months. Thank you. Thank you.